Hey everyone, we're here with the Moving Forward podcast, but we're just doing a little bit differently today due to technical difficulties for the past two weeks. So um, I'm just going to start reading, and we're going to go with it. Uh, and we're going to go, and we're going to go with this uh, late at night. You ready? Okay. So uh, welcome to the Brain Injury Radio Network and our program Moving Forward with Healthy Options on the third slash fourth Sunday of every month. I'm your host, Kelly K.J. Jones, cerebral aneurysm survivor, now an author and life coach. My co-host, Dr. Felicia Harris, a UNC Charlotte professor and national lecturer panelist of women's gender nutrition, gender nutrition, hip hop studies, and more for almost 30 years is here to discuss the contextual aspects of clearly communicating psychoneuroimmunology challenges for the most customized and effective treatment plan. Moving forward with options will host candid discussions with persons who have experienced overdiagnosis, misdiagnosis, misdiagnosis with psychoneuroimmunology conditions and the certified clinicians or trainers who have assisted survivors. Approximately 56% of diagnostic errors are of gaps in patients' self-reporting of social, physical, and cognitive information, and 57% are due to breakdowns in ordering diagnostic tests. There are 525,600 minutes in a year. Still, some patients are extended a psychiatric diagnosis in 60 minutes. Our guest insight on discovery, the line between pain tolerance and pain threshold, as well as healthier pathways to success, will provide hope and more options on how to build momentum for sustainable recovery. Dr. Felicia. Yes. How are you? I'm good. I was just moving around a little bit. That's okay. That, that's an exercise in you. <laughs> getting it, getting, it, getting ready for the getting ready for the zoom. Yes, ma'am. So yes, Dr. ma'am. Dr. Felicia, anything new happened this week? Um Couple a couple of things I think I've noted. Uh, noted. Um, one of the things was this no pass. You have to tell me the schools. But my daughter was actually um, talking to me about that. That there um, has been some discussions around, you know, pass fail at uh, particular institutions, and you know what does that look like on a collegiate campus, especially. A collegiate campus like I'm on, and um, it it's an interesting and and what I'll say to it is we know there are graduate programs where that is a a way that some classes are um, you know formally officially designed to do pass fail. Um, pass fail has been around. This is not something new. It's been around as a tool for students, especially if students are going through, um, you know, uh, some changes or they have things going on at home or health wise. Um, I've had student athletes who might have been injured. That might be an option, but that's not the standard practice in terms of academic um, grading and things like that. So this should bring an, an interesting um, change in how, you know, higher ed is looking, especially with the event of things like chat APT, what does that mean, and AI. So it'll be interesting to see how campuses all over the country will respond to this as maybe more of an option and not just, you know, for a particular case. Um, where students, again, might need some other kind of academic supportive systems, you know, because they have outside things that might be interfering with their academic program. Right, right. right. You're talking about Missouri State University, where some of the professors, not the entire university, has decided to implement this non-grading program, whereas basically you can take the classes pass-fail. One of my ex-boyfriends went to Brown University, and he took the majority of his classes pass fail. And that was back like 30 years ago. Uh, I'm, I'm this age, right? Age, but he took uh, pass fail classes back then. So yes, it is a program that has been around for a while. I, my understanding in the article that I read, the CNN article that I read was that um, 
there's such a high rate of anxiety around grades until what the professors are doing is trying to find more coping mechanisms as well as mechanisms to get students to dig deeper into the curriculum. You know, not so much worrying about the um, outcome of the grade, but there is a trust factor that the students have. Like, you know, well, how I know how I'm doing in the class, how I know from really failing, you know, how I know da, 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 if there's absolutely no grades. So there's a little bit of, you know, getting used to the practice as well. Um, I, I was reading recent in a recent in a 2023 article. My, actually, my daughter sent it to me <laughs> um, in a 2023 article that um 50% of middle school students have anxiety around academics and 75% of high school students have anxiety around academics. So once again, when we're looking at one in three girls, one in three adolescent girls have suicidal ideations, finding a way to reduce that stress is always positive. And that is actually why we have our guest on today, um, Bianca, and please forgive me because I have to pull up her um, profile, but that's why we have our guest on today, Bianca, because she found a way to knock stress out the box, right? So um, she's not a boxer, but I was just kind of, you know, um, get jiggy with it. Just kidding. So basically, a little bit about Bianca before she comes on. I'm so excited about this guest because once again, as levels of stress are steadily increasing, we need more solutions, more opportunities, more active pathways to uh, circumvent this or disrupt this. So Bianca Cotton is the owner of Peak fitness events, a certified group uh, fitness coach, a certified spin instructor, and a digital marketing specialist and mental health advocate. At age 26, she began to reflect on her family's struggle with diabetes, hypertension, obesity, stroke, and more, as well as a personal impasse. She pushed her thoughts towards craving a greater healing and better quality of life. Yes, pushed. Bianca, over the years has trained herself to keep moving even when she feels stuck or hurt. Move forward. When she was 26, she didn't like her life or a romantic partner. <laughs> that happens 26, 25, 28. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, she didn't like her romantic partner. Um, she needed a change and something in her told her to jump ship and start over. It was time to go beyond masking and potholes to solutions, depth, and joy. Fitness opened the door to, for all of these desires, forgiveness, courage, and more. A recent study in Amsterdam revealed that 50% of persons who experience depression and anxiety no longer meet, their, uh, meet the criteria for the diagnosis after completing 16 weeks of running. Even though... I'm sorry, they even lost more than participating um, than other participants who were taking SSRIs. Um, the Yang Tan Institute at Cornell University found similar results in a forced aerobic exercise study for persons with autism. The biggest challenge with an aerobic exercise program is commitment. During our interview, Bianca will share tips on how to overcome distractions and setbacks. Bianca's favorite quote is, feel the fear and do it anyway by Julian Michaels. And I just want to say one thing really quickly. I, I, I kind of laughed at the fact that people are having, uh, you know, that there's the reality that there's stress in romantic relationships, but relationships is, I think, 60% of the reason why young adults are having stress right now, um, having difficulty with developing and maintaining and enhancing relationships. But on the other hand, our co-host celebrated what today? Uh, celebrated 35 years of married relationship. Yay. Yes, 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 yes. So I yes, want to so say it is possible. It can work. It, it, yeah, it, it, it is possible, um, you know, to navigate, you know, a healthy relationship. It is possible, but it still takes a lot of work. So that it's not stress, you know, laden. Yes. Yes. So, yes. 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 So my hero, one day she's gonna write the book and tell us how to do it. But in the meantime, <laughs> in the meantime, because Lord knows some of us like me need help. In the meantime, Bianca, welcome. Hey everyone, how's everyone hey. doing? Hey. Happy Sunday. Yeah. Happy Sunday, Bianca. 
you are doing some amazing things over there, peak fitness and, and moving forward. And right now where so many individuals are having that, that impasse and trying to figure out how to move forward, you have created more pathways and I love it. Um, I noticed that the pathway sometimes, you know, in reality, the pathway isn't always straight. Uh, you're in your listing, you were telling me that as a young adult or as a kid growing up, you ate healthy. Yeah. Um, growing up, eating healthy was like, well, eating healthy, what my parents thought was healthy. That was the way we ate. We weren't allowed to deviate from, you know, not healthy. And if we did, it was like every now and then or shared foods um, or my mom would measure things out for us if it was like too sugary too fattening like fast food like we were we had to eat all of our fruits and vegetables and all that stuff wow so what is what is measurement out like when you say measuring out like did she take a spoon did she have a measuring cup with you when, when you went there was a measuring cup like if we had like say I used to like cinnamon toast crunch uh -huh. I was only allowed to have a cup and that's it there was no cup or big bowl. It was like, oh, we'll measure out your cereal if it was very high in sugar and stuff like that. Is that what you did, Dr. Harris? Did you do that with your kids? Um, no, no, I, di I didn't quite measure out, but we were very um, intentional about the types of things that they could eat. Um, and it was a little bit later that I then understood um, cereals and the impact in terms of you know attention deficit disorder especially with my son the sugar and not realizing initially that you know that bowl of fruit loops was sending him to the stratosphere first class for you know the first period of class so once i understood that uh, but growing up we were probably a lot like bianca um, very, my mom was very methodical about what we consumed, how much we consumed, not a whole lot of sugar. We did not eat out um, candy only maybe on holidays. It might've been Christmas or if she did let us have things during fall, you know, fall, Halloween, then we would get to do it. But very, so I grew up pretty, you know, in a pretty stringent eating pattern, which Today, I do thank my mom for at least, you know, having some forethought about the sugar that was, you know, our food was laden with sugar. So she was very careful about what we had access to and exposure to. So let me ask something, Bianca, even though your mom did the measuring cup and everything, I mean, did you like crave more sugar? Did you want it or were you just self-disciplined? No, I always craved candies mm. because we weren't allowed to have it so you know the pastor mm. at church had it older women had it they would yes, give it to, us, Lord, that, it to that us candy with the wrapper stuck on it <laughs> yeah <laughs> but our teachers had it so it was like I got candy everywhere else but my house so but I was always looking forward to going to my friend's house to get all the candy I could because we weren't allowed to have it so it kind of developed a want in a, in a sense of urgency just to eat something Oh, a sense of urgency. So did you ever like go overboard with it? Oh yeah. God. Yeah. Especially when I get to my first year in college, I was eating terrible because I never had that type of food. So I was just going to town. <laughs> can I, can I please put some sugar on my eggs? <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> yeah. Can I put some sugar on my broccoli? <laughs> right. I was, yeah, I was not that first year of college. I don't, it was sugar, everything. It was candy every night, chocolate, Domino's, pizza, fried wings. It was, you know, I wasn't allowed to have at home. So how did you switch from the sugar to the healthy approach? Or like, what was it? Was it hearing about your family? Was it your personal health? Like, how did you switch from sugar to yeah. exercise? It's crazy. I I knew fried food and so, so... I wanted to step on anyone's toes. I didn't like soul food growing up. Like I already knew that fried foods and pizzas and donuts were bad. Like I just, I didn't really like it. It was just, I had this sweet tooth. And I remember 
going to church when I was a little girl, I would not eat church for like anniversary. I would eat the cake, the pie. And went to church, you know, we had a people who were sick in the church. We always had to pray for the sick and shut in. That list would get longer and longer, like every so and then we would go see these people at the rest home, at the hospital. Uh, there was a couple times I was a little girl. I've seen a couple people have a stroke right in front of me. Um, I've seen people with their limbs cut from diabetes. Wait, with their what? Attacks, limbs, cancer. limbs, limbs. I said limbs. Limbs cut off. It really bothered me as a young girl. So I started not eating because I was like, oh, if I eat all, I'm going to. So I, I had a couple times, a couple years where I lost a lot of weight because I wasn't eating because I was so afraid to get sick. When and you weren't eating anything college, or you just weren't eating sweet? That's when... No, uh, I, I think I went a whole year just eating chocolates and candies mm. and little snacks because I felt if I ate real food, I would end up sick like the people, and I didn't want to be sick. But I had like a crazy addiction to chocolate. It was chocolate. I could, I mean, um, one time I went three weeks, and the only thing I ate was chocolate, and I was running cross country. I was playing basketball. I was running track. So, and I come home, and I would say, yeah, I already ate, y'all. What'd you eat? And I would be like, <laughs> I would eat a bowl of chocolate frosting every day. That's it, with a little bit of popcorn for like wait 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 I have to stop months, so for, for I have to stop you there for a second because I like I like the bowl of frosting which one Duck and Hyde's Betty Cross <laughs> <laughs> no no I would like honestly I would make my own because we weren't allowed to have anything from the package so I'll go get the cocoa powder the butter because my from the country so and my dad wouldn't allow us to eat things up in or a box. So everything, so it was home, man. I would like get the mixer. I don't know why I did that. Just eat chocolate and popcorn. I pop the pop, just dip it before they got home. And they're like, did you already eat? I'm like, yeah, I already ate tonight. Well, I didn't see vegetables. You got to eat your vegetables. You see chocolate and vegetables, I'll go to bed. Mm. What was that doing yeah, to you? So it's kind of like, I was just afraid to eat. What was all that sugar God. doing to well, you? First of all, I couldn't gain any muscles in high school. Yeah, I had muscle in basketball, especially my sophomore. I was just too skinny, and I couldn't, like, I wasn't enough to, uh, I was on varsity, but I didn't gain any muscle. I couldn't get faster. I couldn't get stronger. I was only, like, but I was working out so much, eating, like, Frosties. <laughs> it was just a mess. My athletic gains went down severely especially my sophomore year yeah and I felt tired and very anxious all the time like it was bad it, I probably think I probably think even high school I could control my anxiety but I would have days where I would just feel out of control like my emotions would just be like a mess yeah so so how did you get all that sugar out of your system? Because if you had all that sugar in your system, I mean, did you do like a detox or something? And and you also mentioned that you wanted to play basketball. So is that mm -hmm. why you didn't play basketball because of all the sugar? Um, I played basketball in college, but I was just having so many mental breakdowns. Like I just could not function. And like at college, like I could, it's weird in high school. I couldn't pay attention in school, but I could pay attention in sports. But in college, it was the opposite. I I did really well in school, but I just couldn't pay attention in basketball. It was like my brain was moving way too fast, and I kept having these mental lapses and stuff like that. And I didn't really consider it to be a sugar problem or, any, or a processed food problem until, you know, I got like around 25, 26. So that's when I started developing like more issues um so it's kind of like I didn't realize some of this stuff until later on like much later in my life um when after basketball's over after sports are over after your college friend groups are over I start putting pieces together about my diet and um my sugar craving and I still with sugar like right now you dried fruit fruit and maybe honey but even though I know I, I I know I can much of it, but that's because I've came so far from 
eating candy all day to now eating fruit all day. So it's it's a long process to really confront and get rid of. Wow. And wow. so you were you eating like out of stress or were you eating for like joy? Like why were you eating? <laughs> oh <laughs> I'm laughing. <laughs> oh, the last time I binged ate chocolate was last year around my mother's birthday. I just I got most expensive truffles I could find in Raleigh. Ate a pound of them, <laughs> like one, and one. And it was because I, it's a it's things it's, you're stressed out, and I think it's the emotional. Um, I was reading a book. If someone's craving chocolate, and stuff, but there's they're a sad person. And um, my grandma, all she does is eat. Is, and you know, looking at my grandma's life, you know, she you know she ate sweets because her life was kind of hard. And I look at my life and it's like, I I think I eat sweets because of stress, being sad and, um you know, things like that. I think sweets makes you feel comfort, makes you feel like, like, it's like a little piece of heaven every time you eat it. Yeah. Well, and we know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. well, and we know that sugar, you know, and sweets are like an endorphin anyway. So... Mm -hmm. It's going to give you, you know, that just quick punch to right. lift, lift you up. So I, I can so understand, you know, um, the connection with, you know, sweets in that way, because it's a natural endorphin. The same thing we feel when we, you know, are exercising, running and doing, mm -hmm. you know, weightlifting and fitness and biking and all kinds of aerobic kinds of things. You get that. It's almost identical feeling you know with something like um sugar or mm -hmm. like with um chocolate yes. and then they purposely put things you know additionally in with the chocolate and that further helps us feel you know kind of that nice endorphin feeling you know mm -hmm. that will lift of course your your spirits at that time yeah right <laughs> yep so i, I just want to exactly mention right. I just wanted to mention, as far as um, stress is concerned, there are certain factors, uh, because it's such a high thing right now with kids, as I mentioned beforehand, the 50% for middle schools, 5% mm -hmm. for high school students, et cetera, stress, whether it be academic sports, you know, whether or not I'm going to be able to get into college, whether or not I'm going to be able to make the game, play in the game, et cetera. It, there's a lot of different stress factors for young adults that we miss. Sometimes we miss, but we can also see the symptoms. One thing, one tangible thing is we can see the symptoms on an MRI. So an MRI, actually there's a flicker, which will let you know a person has stress and the level of stress. Um, but uh, what I wanted to mention, some of the symptoms or some of the conditions, and I wanted to ask you, Bianca, if you saw any of these in the process. So some of the conditions are um, abdominal pain, nausea, ingestion, uh, um, indigestion, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, mm -hmm. uh, diarrhea, uh, constipation, depression, headaches, um, allergies. Mm -hmm. So histamine, what histamine causes allergies, mm -hmm. and um, it's basically um, uh, it's released when you have stress. So allergies and asthma are impacted. Obesity, heart disease, um, tense muscle pain, inflammation. Uh, uh, it even acts impacts colds. Actually, people who have stress have more colds than the average person. Um, dizziness, shortness of breath. So basically, um, the body has an auto uh, autonomic nervous system, right? Which controls the heart rate. It controls your breathing. It controls your vision. And so what happens is if you're in a continuous state of stress, you're overworking the on and off button or the leveling of it. So what happens is your body's no longer able to, um, because of all the stress, it's no longer able to properly address stressful situations, right? So beforehand, it would be able to, if the stress was escalating, it would be able to manage it, but this way it's not. Um, the other thing that I wanted to mention was alopecia. Alopecia can be caused by stress. Um, people can lose one half to three fourths of their hair based on stress. So I wanted to, we have about 10 minutes left. I wanted you and Dr. Felicia just to talk about once again, the endorphins and running and how you got into it, how you stay committed because Dr. Felicia is a marathon runner. So if you guys can just kind of talk about the exercise and the commitment. 
so um, Bianca, what um, specific types of you know activity and movement do you like or do you enjoy? Uh, weightlifting, uh, heavy weightlifting is one of my favorite things to do, and uh, teaching fitness is always good, like cardio based stuff. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm really starting to like the uh, stair climber. I used to be just like a group fitness type of chick, but now I can really get in the zone with uh, with those types of exercises. And the heavy lifting, you know, for our listeners, exactly, um, you know, explain what that is for people who Oof, might not. I'm, I'm lifting about trying to lift my max, my max rep weight every time I go to the gym, whether it's a max mountain squats, deadlifts, low bar squats, presses, leg presses and stuff like that. I try to go as heavy as possible where I can only do at least four reps at a time. Um, it's a lot of, so, so for example, I weigh like 165, I probably would deadlift 160 pounds, like five pounds off from my weight or I would deadlift that much. Cause um, it's, I'm telling you, lifting heavy weights has helped me get through a heartbreak, get through stressful times. You know, the last two years of my life has been pretty stressful and lifting heavy just makes me feel more accomplished. Like I can, like I can push through the mountain. So that's what I do um, more than anything. I, I love, but I also do yoga. I mean, but okay. lifting weights has really helped me um, level out my emotions. Wow. I just saw um, some research on um, strength-based strength training, particularly um, as, you know, we age and as um, women in particular age and they were um, suggesting for people to, you know, investigate, you know, doing strength-based training, not just, you know, on the machine, but like mm -hmm. you said, with dead weights, because mm -hmm. that is what maintains you know, our musculature, and that is what helps us maintain, you know, our, um, our bones, our um, flexibility. If you are doing things like running and, you know, riding bikes, I can tell the difference. And um, as we celebrated our um, wedding anniversary, we were also at my um, high school reunion and it was interesting, the, the most interesting thing I remember, because I remember vividly what people look like when we were in high school. And so mm -hmm. in, my, in my mind, I'm thinking that vision, but then I had to pull back for a minute and remember, of course, where we were in terms of our age and how many people really, you know, uh, dedicate time to exercising, because a lot of people we're coming because mm. they know I'm doing half marathons. A couple of people ask me about full marathon. And so I'm, you know, trying to jump off the cliff to um, to that next level race. But what I was telling them is the biggest thing, and um, Kelly just mentioned it, with any kind of fitness is the commitment. Sounds like, you know, of course you have a commitment yeah. to doing, um, you know, your exercise training and and doing it in a way where you're consistent. And I know that's one thing that can be difficult for people to be consistent. It's like, oh, I, you know, I'm exercising, I lost weight. And I encourage people to think about it as a lifestyle change. So don't change, you know, just to lose weight, change to maintain your health. And then you'll right. see the benefits. You'll see it in the, you know, mm -hmm. the way you feel, of course. It helps with your mental health. Um, you know, as we age, it helps. I know I just saw another research they were talking, he was talking about dementia and Alzheimer's and he was talking about exercise and again, this strength-based training, Bianca, that you just talked about and in comparison, comparing, you know, older individuals who committed to some form of exercise. I think he was looking at um, groups of 100-year-old um, individuals out of a, a, a small town in, I believe it's Japan, which has the most yeah. hundred year old. Oh, yeah. The common mm -hmm. denominator was they moved every single day. 
-hmm. They were not, you know, some were kind of sitting. They were either in the garden, one of the towns, they had to walk up and down hills. And it was fascinating listening because they it wasn't like they were in, you know, formal situations like us in a gym. They were just in their natural, normal, you know, um, where they live in their community. But every single day they were moving, moving, moving. And that was one of the variables that they kept mentioning, in addition to diet, but they were saying having the ability to be able to move, to walk to your neighbor's house, mm -hmm. to walk, you know, to the center of town. But they were committed and consistent to doing it every single day. And you can see it because the people they uh, documented, they didn't look like they were 100 years old. Maybe 60, 70, maybe. They looked fantastic. And, and they were very um, flexible, too. You know, they were able to move, no knee surgeries. I think I saw one, two, three, maybe five people with complete knee surgeries during my reunion time, complete knee surgery. These were people mm. who were athletes in high school. And as the years went on, you know, their exercise commitment, of course, changed. And you you know, may see some of the residuals of it now. Guys, we're at the two and a half minute mark. So Bianca, if you could just give us one or two tricks that you use to uh, make sure that you stay committed and then also highlight your business. Um, and then Dr. Felicia, oh, yeah. then I'll use closing remarks. Okay, so to stay committed is you have to go past, everyone says fine your why, but I, I, I don't agree with that anymore. I think to really stay committed, you have to find a passion and moving, like like Dr. Felicia said, you have to you have to find a passion of living. Why do you get up in the morning? Like you have to have the will to live. Once you have the will to live and live at an optimal life, then that would be your commitment. You have to say commit to living well, you know. Um, so what I do now, I do fitness festivals and workout series with local towns and cities um, in Apex and in Holly Springs. Um, it's called Peak Events. It's, it's becoming an LLC tomorrow, which I'm excited about. And we are growing. Um, the last festival we had was August 13th. We had 190 people. So next year we're going to have a festival in Holly Springs in May. And then we'll have another one in September at Apex. And we're just going to keep adding pop-up fitness. And our mission is to make fitness accessible, but it's also to tackle the biggest issue which is the culture of fitness and the culture of wellness. So, yeah. Wow. Wonderful. Thank that you. Is wonderful, wonderful. Dr. Felicia? Oh, I get the last, last words. Uh, again, I think um, really what has hit me with this subject matter tonight was being at that reunion and hopefully my story inspired some of my classmates to really get back out there and you know could be consistent with whatever they choose to do whether it's swimming you know whether it's ballroom dancing whether it's walking any move any movement i was just talking can you, you do know, me very quickly you probably have about 30 seconds can you highlight your business yeah so because i was talking to a classmate be committed don't over think it. Don't overindulge yourself, but be committed and keep it small, as Bianca said. Keep it small. Keep it small and be committed, you know, to it being something that you're passionate about. Okay. And your your site? Me. Your site. Your site for nutrition. Oh, um, 